right. Hello. Welcome to everyone here for Restoring a Vision, Recovering Bruce Moore's Landscape. I am excited to host you tonight. My name is Katie Benedicts. I am the Development Manager here at Bruce Moore, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to some of my wonderful colleagues tonight and then pass the baton onto them to share the information that we have for you tonight. We have a couple of goals for this presentation that I'm just going to cover right here off the bat. We really want you to know at the end of this presentation what our process has been and where we are right now in our journey of recovering the landscape. We want to define a few expectations and assumptions for you so you know when you see something happening, what does that mean and why? And then we also want to just inspire in you the same passion that we feel for the landscape so that when you see things happening and you are aware, you can uh, feel the same sense of accomplishment with us as we continue on this journey. For those of you who, be, who may be unaware, the mission of Bruce Moore is to inspire community interaction with history, preservation, and the arts. What does that mean? Well, we're doing it right now tonight. You have joined us for this call. You're interacting with us. And on that note, I wanna remind you, go ahead and open that Q&A box. We're gonna be answering questions um, as we go. And then we have a time at the end of this presentation set aside to answer questions live as you think of them. So go ahead make sure that Q&A box is open and begin um, sharing your questions with us as we go through this presentation. There are gonna be three parts to this presentation and you can see I have three colleagues joining me um, that are each going to take a portion of this. We're going to start with landscape history. It's important to us that you have a foundation of knowledge about why the landscape looks the way that it does uh, has, and how it has changed over the years that this place has existed since 1886. Uh, and then we're gonna transition into what it takes to care for the site, be on the ground for specifically in the last 15 months and how that has really transitioned as a result of the storm. And then we're going to end with impact and recovery, introducing you to the process um, our concepts and the themes of the recovery plan that we are going to be um, in and working for the next five years, probably. And then, of course, like I said, we'll end with that Q&A. So let's just jump right in because that's what you're all here for. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Jessica Peel Austin, uh, Museum Program Manager here at Bruce Moore. Jessica is a native Iowan who joined Bruce Moore in the fall of 2013. She's graduated from the University of Northern Iowa with a bachelor's degree in history and public history and completed her master's degree uh, in history at the University of Iowa. She has worked at several museums and research institutions, including the Cedar Falls Historical Society, Hometown Perry, Living History Farms, the Johnson County Historical Society, and the Office of the State Archaeologist. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, Katie. Uh, so like Katie said, I am going to be talking about the history of the landscape, just kind of get us all on the same page so we understand why our landscape is important and how we got to where we are today. Um, so Bruce Moore's landscape is one of our most significant resources as a historic site and a community cultural center. I know a lot of our audience tonight is from the community and even from the neighborhood and they enjoy coming to the grounds and just taking a walk, walking their dog, coming to our outdoor cultural events, uh, going on tours, um, and just enjoying the grounds and the beauty that is um, a part, has been a part of our community um, since the 18. 80s. And so I want to make sure that we are um, kind of all on the same page again as um, and understanding why it is such an important landscape and a history. Um, so the story of Bruce Moore really starts in 1884 um, when Caroline Sinclair, um, who is the widow of T.M. Sinclair, a meatpacker here in Cedar Rapids, and her six children, um, she purchases 10 acres of land from the Dow's family. Um, at this point, this is largely undeveloped land. There are very few residences nearby. There is some farmland around, but for the most part, it really hadn't experienced a lot of residential or developmental growth. Uh, so she purchases 10 acres, and that site consists mostly of our First Avenue lawn, and then the area where the mansion is, and then kind of directly south 
to about where the greenhouse lawn is today. And that's really uh, pretty much all there was to the site. She doesn't do a whole lot in the way of landscaping. Uh, she does plant trees around the, the drives leading up from First Avenue. There is an orchard, there is a garden um, that is maintained on the property. We know a gardener was employed um, from records that we do have, but otherwise it is a largely unlandscaped area. Um, we don't really have a lot of records of what the house looked like um, during this time. Um, we don't have a lot of pictures. We don't have a lot of archival evidence for it either. And so our research in this area is really kind of based on what we have been able to find. Um, but the important thing to remember about the Sinclair family is that Caroline is part of a larger trend of wealthy families moving away from urbanized areas and into the countryside, which at that point was thought to be uh, the healthy thing to do, uh, the ideal environment to raise a family. And so she is part of that trend here in Cedar Rapids. So in 1906, Caroline has owned the home for about 20 years. At that point, her children are grown. She no longer needs an estate this size. And um, so she starts looking at different options um, for homes and, and what she wants to do with the house. So at that point, uh, she actually trades homes with the Douglas family. And the Douglases at this point were George Bruce Douglas, his wife, Irene, and their two daughters, Margaret and Ellen, Barbara being born shortly after they moved to the property in 1908. Uh, so they trade homes, Caroline moves to their old house, and the Douglases move to uh, what they would call Bruce Moore. Um, so they purchase the property and they expand the estate from Caroline's original 10 acres to an additional 33. So they purchase land essentially to the south, the east, and the west of the property, and um, really expand the estate to it, what would be its kind of full size. Um, they make interior alterations as well as adding porches and terraces to the mansion and changing the main entrance uh, from the north side of the house to the south side, which coincides with their vision for what they wanted their new found country estate to be. Um, so like Caroline, the Douglases are kind of expanding on this um, trend of wealthier people um, moving into the countryside. And they are part of what is called the country estate movement here in the US. So very similar to what you would see on the large estates in Europe and places like England, um, you have these large estates that are largely self-sufficient. Um, they can raise a lot of their own foods and animals have orchards and gardens and pretty much are kind of villages unto themselves. You don't really have to go off site to get a lot of the things that you need. So to meet that mission of becoming kind of a country estate, they add a lot of buildings to the property. So they add the servants duplex, a new carriage house and barn, a guest house, bookbinder and squash court, a greenhouse, and chicken coop. So they uh, not only expand the actual footprint of the landscape, they also expand the built environment as well. Um, to also meet that goal, again, of a country kind of self-sufficient landscape, they add a lot of agricultural elements. So they have an orchard, they have a cutting garden, the greenhouse again, an alfalfa field to raise food for the animals that they were raising here on the property. Um, again, just to make the estate kind of self-sustaining. Uh, spaces for leisure and enjoyment of the family and guests were also added So things like the wading pool, the pond, the formal gardens, the tennis court, walking paths through the woods, things like that. So the map that you see on your screen really highlights all of the different things that were happening on the estate. Irene had a very specific vision for her estate, and she works very closely with a particular landscape architect, um, O.C. Simons, to kind of craft her vision and to hone what she wanted her estate to become. She was a passionate about the landscape. She loved to garden herself. She wasn't out there mowing the lawn and, and doing things like that, but she definitely loved to work in her garden and she loved to participate in the planning of the estate. So she hires Ossie and Cole Simons or O.C. Simons to help her design the landscape 
of her new estate. Um, he was a Michigan native like Irene, so I'm sure there was some affinity there. And he was a lover of nature, uh, just like Irene was. Um, he is known as one of the fathers of the Prairie School of Landscape Design, which is what um, are the hallmarks of the landscape that he and Irene created here on Bruce Moore's estate. So, so we understand what it what, what it means when we say Prairie School of Landscape Design. I'll kind of go through some of the hallmarks of that style and point out some of the places where you can see those things on our estate. Uh, so natural landforms were very important to O.C. Simons. Uh, he would often leave trees in place and um, build roadways or pathways around them. He wouldn't smooth out hills. He would leave those pieces intact to give an impression of what the natural environment was supposed to be like. He used a lot of common native plants, not importing a lot of things that aren't really supposed to be there to encourage a love of, again, the naturally occurring environment of an area. Outdoor rooms are a, uh, a thing that you see a lot on our state, especially in the formal garden. And when we say an outdoor room, it's kind of an enclosed space. So um, a kind of room-like, creation outdoors with the sod as your ground or as your carpet, uh, the hedges or the plantings on the sides creating your walls, then the overstory framing the sky. So it kind of creates, again, that enclosed feeling, giving you the impression that you are in a very designed space outdoors. Um, repetition of horizontal lines, you see a lot. The building the understory is very important to O.C. Simons. Uh, and framing the long view. And I, I chose this picture of the pond because um, the pond is a great example of this. Um, so there are breaks in the trees on either side of the pond, either looking toward the urns or toward the mansion. And so it's done that way so that it frames the view of what you, OC is intending the audience to be looking at. Um, he creates a lot of mystery throughout his landscape, uh, giving you kind of um, these pathways to follow and planted in such a way that it kind of intrigues you to move on to the next space and see what's coming next. And overall, he's just encouraging a love of subtle beauty and natural uh, forms in his landscape designs. He also designs the Ridgewood development around Bruce Moore. So Bruce Moore is not kind of a, not an island unto itself of his design. It's really supposed to blend into the larger neighborhood surrounding us. Um, employees from Simon's firm continue to work on the estate throughout the rest of Irene Douglas's life. Uh, so people like Helen Dupuy, Roy West from his firm are coming onto the estate and continuing to work on crafting that vision. What's another really important thing about our landscape is that it reflects the lives of the servants. So like I mentioned, Irene wasn't out there mowing the lawn and, and kind of digging in the dirt on a daily basis. Um, it really reflects the um, labor and the um, daily work of the people whose job it was to keep an estate this size running and functioning and looking beautiful. Uh, so we have those fingerprints kind of all around us and we have to remember that legacy. Uh, and also keep in mind that some of the landscape features were placed in such a way to disguise some of that labor. So screening around the servant's village or the cutting garden, for example, is designed to kind of hide some of that labor from the family and from the guests. So you kind of get this illusion that it all just kind of happens uh, kind of magically. So when Irene passes away in 1937, she leaves the home and the estate to her um, eldest daughter, Margaret, and Margaret's husband, Howard. Um, and they live on the estate from 1937 until 1981. Um, they lived a much less formal lifestyle than Margaret's parents had. Uh, they don't employ as many servants. Um, they just do a lot more kind of casual activities instead of kind of formal parties and things like that. Um, and it's also important to remember that although Margaret loved the landscape and she kept the estate looking beautiful, she, it wasn't a passion in the same way that it was for her mother. Um, so she doesn't necessarily always share that same vision for the estate that Irene had. 
Um, they do reduce the size of the estate. They simply didn't need some of the areas um, that the Douglases had. So they sold a few acres, bring it to its present size of 26, but they don't make a whole lot of changes to the landscape overall. Um, they do make a few changes in terms of adding some character defining features. So things like the pet cemetery, the, um, the picnic table by the pond, for example, uh, they're important features, but they don't necessarily reflect uh, that earlier Douglas era with O.C. Simons. So when Margaret uh, gives the estate to the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 1981, um, we become a museum and a cultural site and have been um, ever since. So I just want to um, kind of make one final note about our period of significance and kind of how we came to um, really want to interpret the Douglas era as um, the, the time period that we look at in our landscape. So we chose that primarily because it's, it's really when the landscape is at its full height. Um, all of our um, outbuildings were built around the, in, in that Douglas era, and um, the planning of the landscape really happens then. Um, it is defined still to this day by many of the elements that were um, chosen during that time period. And so we, since our, the development of our historic landscape plan in 1997 and the research that went into it, uh, we have been interpreting primarily the Douglas era since then. Uh, so like I mentioned in the halls, uh, while we were talking about the halls, there are still a lot of features that they added to the landscape that are important um, and continue to remain some defining features today. So even though we interpret that broader Douglas era, um, there are still some features that you see kind of crossing over from other time periods. So um, that kind of concludes our landscape history section. I'll turn it back over to Katie to lead us into the next part. Thank you, Jessica. That was wonderful. We appreciate that kind of foundation of knowledge. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take that history and we're going to talk about what it takes to care for the landscape today. And to do that, I am very happy to introduce you to Aaron Brewer, our historic landscape manager. Uh, he was hired here at Versmore in January of 2020, quite a fateful time to be hired. Uh, he brings five years of experience in ecosystem management from the Iowa State Park System, as well as program manager at Trees Forever, and several season as several seasons as groundskeeper at the Grantwood House in Iowa City. All right, thanks, Kate. Thank you, Katie, and thanks, Jessica. That was really inspiring stuff. Um, I'm going to briefly cover uh, what we're doing to manage the landscape, kind of before, during, and after the derecho, along with some efforts we've made towards replanting. So here is a bird's eye shot of the estate and all the areas that we have the privilege to maintain. And this is our seasonal grounds crew picture here. Uh, it's Jeff, Scott, and Kira. And they've all been dedicated to maintaining our grounds and some of them for many seasons. So they typically work from April through September. And you might also note that these photos are in color as we're in a different era. Um, so. Our seasonal employees, along with David Morton and myself, are the primary caretakers of the grounds here. So we're not a huge crew by any means. And our primary duties consist of weekly mowing and trimming, maintaining the formal gardens, plant propagation within our greenhouses, tree trimming, uh, lots of watering in the gardens and uh, new plant material in the landscape, as well as seasonal cleanup. So even without a derecho, uh, the 26 acres keeps us very busy. And when the storm did first hit, we worked to get the roads cleared first off and the event spaces cleared so we, we could reach a point to open back up to our visitors. Um, and it took about seven hours to clear a path to get to the Linden Gate on the very first day. So uh, we continue our general weekly maintenance while doing the storm cleanup. Our duties as ground staff have changed a bit in the last 15 months. Uh, this is a map I put together about eight months or so ago, uh, representing in red what is damaged and lost, and in yellow what is damaged and still standing. So you can see the enormity of uh, what we're dealing with. Um, 
we kind of had to adapt from our primary tasks of being more of a turf management or a gardening crew to kind of becoming lumberjacks and clearing the 450 damaged trees and shrubs. So uh, it was a lot to take on, definitely given the size of our crew and the equipment that we have on hand here. And we don't have a lot of accessible curb space um, along the perimeter of the estate. Like many residents were hauling brush to the curb. So we hauled about 300 loads of brush to the landfill, um, along with staging trees over about two acres of grass in the front lawn so that we could clear the interior of the landscape and have a contractor come and, and chip those up. But we would often celebrate getting eight loads per day <laughs> to the landfill. As you all experienced, uh, it was a strange thing to celebrate, but we did what we had to to recover. Um, and we had a lot of help. We had a lot of volunteer days, a lot of great contractors, and finally feel we made it to a point where we turn the page and we're almost getting used to seeing what we see now every day and uh, really begin the phases of replanting. Uh, with the loss of so much tree canopy uh, and disturbed soil from heavy equipment uh, during the debris removal, we see a lot of weedy vegetation growing in our woodland and our pond woods. So we're really working to control that shrub layer uh, to kind of prevent terrestrial succession and invasive species and kind of reestablish native plants. So it's another new maintenance task since derecho and takes time for our crew to manage. And we're also mindful of erosion control and uh, with reduced canopy, we see a lot of algae growth on the pond surface. So we really made an effort to clean that up and then reestablish our pond and our woodland trails for visitor use. Uh, you can see some young trees in this photo and those white tree tubes. Uh, so we planted river birch and swamp white oaks here. And they are protected by these tree tubes as we have a strong um, deer population and deer pressure on the property. And you can also see in the photo some stumps. So that's another task in itself, which we hire to a contractor. And we mostly prioritize stumps in the heavily trafficked areas. Uh, but we still have 100 or more to go. So it's a very costly task, and I would say often overlooked in the recovery process. Uh, once the stumps are ground up by the contractor, our crew is tasked with clearing that debris, refilling it with fertile soil, and uh, watering and reestablishing turf. So with some funding, we, we hope to make some more progress next season. But another very strange feeling to celebrate a stump gone because it represents a lost tree, but one more task towards recovery. And if you frequent the grounds or even drive by, you may notice some areas that are still torn up from our heavy machinery and particularly the alfalfa field in this photo along Linden Drive. We frequently drove uh, heavy machinery to stage trees on the curbside of Linden and Crescent. And we try not to put resources into areas before making replanting decisions or where construction may be ongoing or upcoming. So I guess the landscape around the mansion itself, that would be an example. Uh, we won't work on re-landscaping around the mansion until we know we're done with that restoration project. So so that we're not undoing our own efforts. And the alfalfa field is just a zone uh, that we haven't been able to reestablish grass yet until our planning is complete. So you also see a lot of poor turf conditions uh, where the canopy was lost in the bottom right of this photo is just basically the root zone of, of lost trees that are decaying or never really had fertile soil in the first place because the root was taking up so much of that area. So turf management is an ongoing task. Um, something that we're going to invest in. And I'd also, I guess, mention that we're going to work to repair lots of the smaller divots across the property um, in the next season. And we've also been able to uh, replant and select zones um, using donated trees in the areas that we knew would, wouldn't likely change from our research. So those areas include the orchard uh, where we planted 20 fruit trees with Iowa Big students on Earth Day this year. And we also 
uh, planted it along the pond and in the woodland. So, and then select areas in the landscape interior. So we used a lot of volunteers for that work. Uh, Feed Iowa First, Trees Forever, and Iowa Big help us out and have great community partnerships. And I would say that being a tree lover, it's it's definitely tough to not go out and plant 500 trees and shrubs. And because I, I know it's important to go through the planning process so that we are intentional and we're putting the right tree species in the right place of the right size um, so that we can also stay true to the prairie style philosophy in our era of interpretation. And I guess lastly, um, monitoring damaged trees, all those yellow dots on that map, we'll continue to monitor several trees uh, that were damaged and move forward with removal uh, if necessary. So definitely been an adventure for our crew. Uh, thank you all for sticking with us. Um, we know landscapes change every day, but no one imagined experiencing that devastation. Uh, I know when I started this position, I was concerned about all the aging trees and reaching their lifespan. Never imagined that natural disaster to that capacity. So we actually had a storm blow through on July 10th, about a month prior to the derecho and lost a large spruce tree and some major limbs and a few other trees. And um, we thought that that was tough, but uh, hopefully we've seen the worst of it. Thank you, Aaron, for your insights and your um, experience in what it's taken to care for the landscape in this kind of new world that we're in. Um, but now let's let's move beyond what we're doing today and think about what's next. And to do that, I'm going to introduce our executive director, David Jansen. David is a seventh generation Iowan with 29 years of experience in historic site leadership. He has served as the executive director of Bruce Moore since uh, January of 2012. Prior to that, he served as the vice president of the Detroit Historical Society, the vice president of the Edsel and Eleanor Ford House in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. Um, and while there, he was responsible for preservation of an 87 acre historic landscape. And in addition to all of that, David uh, has also served as the assistant director of Bruce Moore from 1993 until 2001. So we convinced him to come back and here he is to talk about our recovery process moving forward. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you, uh, Jessica and Aaron. Um, uh, this is a really a tremendous staff, so I'm really proud to have a lot of, of people here uh, around us doing all this work, and I'm glad that you all get to see some examples of, of the people who do the work behind the scenes. Uh, the significance of Bruce Moore, let me elevate this literally uh, uh, for some context. Um, Aaron talked about the work that goes into maintaining the site. Uh, Jessica talked about the, the deep history of this state. So let's think a little bit uh, about the significance of Bruce Moore on a macro scale, um, the significance to us as a community, the significance of Bruce Moore nationally. Uh, this, number one, is an extremely rare, authentic example of a working estate from the, from the early 1900s. The entire estate is relatively intact. It's not uh, just the mansion, it's the, the outbuildings, the staff buildings, the guest house, garden house, and the landscape that they designed. Our founding director, director Peggy Whitworth, uh, fought this battle for uh, about 26 years that the Douglases didn't name the mansion Bruce Moore. They named the estate Bruce Moore. Um, it's the entire estate that's part of it, and the landscape is certainly uh, a contributor to that. Um, and it's rare in the Midwest and it's rare in the United States. Secondly, the way that we have been using the estate since 1981, Joffrey um, Ballet, establishing outdoor theater in Eastern Iowa, concerts, plays, uh, tours, exhibits, the, the ways that we have tried to innovate and, and find ways for you all to experience our history, our culture uh, with the estate as a backdrop. This is not simply a venue but the estate of Bruce Moore is part of the uh, experience. We're part of the cultural economy. We benefit the arts, arts organizations, individual performers, uh, and we create opportunities for visitors and for residents to, to find your own meaning and to find your own benefit from the community or from the, from the uh, landscape. And then third, as a preservation organization, we know that Bruce Moore creates a sense of place. 
Bruce Moore is a defining feature uh, in our in our community's character in our identity. It is a link uh, to the past. So we feel very strongly about preserving that link across multiple generations uh, as, as an anchor memory uh, for the entire community. The landscape was, is, and will always be a critical part of all of that. The great show that we suffered uh, as a community, uh, it's important to remember how extensive and historic that event was. The, I know that many of you uh, uh, watching were, were here, uh, live here, and uh, I'm sure you heard what we heard from the contractors who were coming in from out of state, contractors who work for hurricanes and work uh, in disaster relief around the country. Consistently, we heard from people outside of our community that this was the worst that they'd ever seen. And it's not that it was necessarily more destructive than a hurricane, but that there was so much old growth tree um, canopy here that the, the density of all of that uh, was just devastated. The amount of loss, uh, what it did to our, um, our infrastructure, what it did to our built environment is staggering. So it's, it's important to remember that. And then remember that sense of isolation we all felt. Uh, we had no power at Bruce Moore for, for two weeks. There were scarce resources that we all dealt with, main, main arteries around the uh, community, as well as around our state, were closed off by major tree damage. So this was a massive event. And Bruce Moore was a microcosm of that destruction. We were uh, in the epicenter of some of the worst uh, gust and worst areas uh, hit. The authentic and the beautiful, um, and in some cases, majestic cultural landscape that we are charged with preserving for you um, was devastated. We, you know, the storm on August 10th, 2020 continues to claim trees. Uh, but right now we estimate we're going to lose around 450 major trees, about 75% of our canopy. In 45 minutes, we lost four generations of growth. Uh, that's just staggering. And as far as we know, and talking from, from experts around the country and our peers and colleagues, no historic site, no cultural landscape uh, has ever lost that much original material in one day in U.S. history. The, the devastation is enormous. And, uh, but despite that dubious distinction, um, it does provide us with a unique opportunity. We have a chance uh, not only to restore the landscape and to reestablish Bruce Moore and continue our role as a, as a spark in the uh, cultural community and as a, as a place for you to love and to enjoy. We also have an opportunity to model restoration uh, around the country for our profession and for other historic sites around the country. There are on average 1.4 historic house museums per county in the United States, 1.4 historic house museums per county. Um, climate is changing. And we unfortunately have to embrace the fact that a devastation and a, and a major event like this is going to happen again. What we have an opportunity to do is be a leader uh, in demonstrating how in a best practice way to recover and restore a cultural landscape and, uh, and maintain that history and maintain that connection. And we're positioned for success in that um, in a number of ways. N number one, for 40 years, Bruce Moore has been aspiring to best practices in all areas of what we do. Um, in historic site leadership, in engagement, partnership, uh, collaboration, interpretation, historic preservation. And that certainly translates to how we have always treated our landscape as an artifact, as Jessica said, as evidence of the past, as, as an important thing that we steward. Um, Secondly, it's the base of knowledge that we have drawn upon. It's the archival resources, letters, documents, photographs, and institutional and intentional self-studies and reports. Our first historic landscape report uh, in 1997 um, gave us uh, three volumes of information about the history of the landscape. We followed that up in 2013 with um, a, um, a management plan uh, and a treatment plan to help guide the work of Aaron and his predecessors, David Morton, Roger Johnson, the people who worked on the estate, Deb Engmark. So 
that we could maintain the significance of the estate uh, across the different uh, staffs and iterations of Bruce Morris organization. Uh, we have that knowledge. Jessica has that knowledge base at her disposal. Aaron, David Morton, they have that experience with the nuances of our estate. So we know the estate very well. Third, I think the strategic steps that we've taken in the last 18 months set us up for success. And I'll talk about that in the, in the next slide, but it was a very difficult time for all of us physically, emotionally, mentally to get through this. But um, the way that the staff, our board of trustees, our volunteers, our supporters in the community um, supported, gave us space, gave us encouragement, um, uh, gave us input, uh, really helped shape a direction and a very methodical, strategic, intentional path forward. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And then finally, the fourth thing would be that, that support. Um, the not only the steps we've taken, but having the encouragement from all of you. Uh, we know that you love this estate uh, as much as we do, and we are committed to uh, to um, make sure, making sure we bring it back for the next few generations. The way we're going to do that, and this is the timeline that illustrates uh, kind of the three threads that we've been working on behind the scenes. And the first thread, the recovery you've probably seen driving by or in our social media posts, uh, or on our uh, YouTube channel. It began at, uh, gosh, one, two o'clock in the afternoon on, on August 10, 2020, jumping out and trying to clear a path so the staff could get home. Uh, I think it took Aaron and David and their colleagues, uh, our, our seasonal staff, um, until six o'clock when we could finally get people out of these sites. But that's continued. We have been uh, doing a wonderful job, aided by contractors and volunteers for sure. But the heart of that is our is our small staff working to remove tree and debris removal um, from the estate. Behind the scenes, um, we have also been very methodical and, and leaning into the challenge of thinking about how this restoration should go forward. It began with a uh, design charrette uh, earlier this year. That's an architectural um, process uh, that's typical um, in trying to gather information. It's a brainstorm. We, we gathered, I think, 40, 50 people from around the uh, city and from around the country to, to try to make sure that we weren't missing anything, missing opportunities. You can't do everything that we all want, but we wanted to make sure we didn't leave anything on the table. We wanted to cast a very wide net to understand what our, what our potential is. And that led into, by the way, I wanna point out these processes are led by some, some leading professionals in the country. Uh, Bob Greasy, who I'd worked with in, in, uh, when I was in Michigan, uh, from the University of Michigan, led that design charrette. He's a leading scholar on Jens Jensen and the, and the uh, O.C. Simons and um, this country state movement and this Prairie School of Landscape Architecture. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fortunate pleasure to have Bob available to lead that. Uh, Heidi Homan, a distinguished professor, lecturer, teacher at Iowa State University, uh, who did our management plan in 2013, uh, enthusiastically came back to help us with the uh, the treatment plan post Dracho. So uh, we are aided by some able uh, leaders in our field. The treatment plan, which was just delivered um, last week, um, after a, a long summer of work uh, by Heidi and her graduate assistants. Uh, lays out a road lays out a roadmap for uh, what this estate is going to look like and helps us define choices. The next step is is a very detailed re replanting plan. Uh, in in architectural terms, when you would when we restore the mansion, we have a design development phase and then construction document phase. The replanting plan is essentially the construction documents that get to very specific areas, and there are character defining features on this estate that we will focus intently on with this replanting, the pond and the pond surrounds, uh, the mansion area, the formal gardens for sure. There is a fascinating stretch from the, uh, from the garden house uh, through the formal garden, up past the night garden, past the pet cemetery, up to the pond and into the pond woods that um, Heidi has uncovered some really wonderful images and some wonderful research that uh, is going to kind of redefine uh, how we well, how we think about that area. And so we will define some of these five or six significant zones that will really focus on these replanting efforts. And that will be phased. Uh, I think you'll see the first major restoration coming in our fiscal year beginning April 1 of next year. So we will 
take Heidi's plan and uh, transition that into a uh, replanting plan that we will contract for. And then that will guide really the next uh, one to five years of, of restoring this landscape, not just the plantings, but small architectural steps. The, you know, there's a potential for irrigation in the gardens. There's a potential to, to make it come back stronger uh, and better um, and maintain it in a way that our small staff uh, can continue to maintain. So that's what we see going forward. And I wanna conclude by acknowledging, you know, that, that there, there certainly is a long road ahead of us. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, we'll be able to replace four generations of growth in one, two, three, or five years. Um, but we've accomplished a great deal in the last 18 months, um, largely on the, the, through the efforts of, of people like you're seeing here, the staff, who um, it's not only cutting, it's not only removing, it's not only dealing with the really physical and emotional work of clearing the landscape, but um, you know, coordinating um, with FEMA, coordinating with insurance—that's a—that's a heavy lift. Uh, FEMA is came in and helped with some of the debris removal, but that's that's not a that's not an easy get. Sometimes uh, our volunteers certainly backing that up. Neighbors, donors, advocates, all backing these people up. Um, meanwhile, remember that Bruce Moore continued to function. We continued in the midst of a pandemic to find new ways to reach audiences, to find new ways to engage you in our programming and to help reinvigorate the arts economy, help uh, bring artists and uh, arts organizations back on site uh, last year. Uh, we continued to restore the mansion. We were in the midst of a four year mansion restoration process when the storm hit and we suffered an additional $3 million in damage to all seven structures. So in the midst of all that con uh, context, um, th the staff, board, volunteers, trustees, neighbors, donors, advocates, uh, all of you have leaned forward with us and helping us move forward. So we're, we're grateful for that. And finally, you know, at the heart of our mission, uh, which Katie mentioned at the top, uh, is our desire to have all of you fall in love with this estate uh, the way we do. So I know that this restoration is going to feed off that shared passion. It's going to benefit from that learned resiliency that we've all uh, come to embrace in the last 18 months. And uh, we, are, we are grateful for your participation. We're grateful for your interest. And uh, we're grateful to have you as partners in the years ahead. Thank you, David. I don't think I could say it any better myself, uh, though I will paraphrase what he just said to say that it really is because of the people who are on this call and our donors who could make it tonight, our friends, our neighbors, and the volunteers who've really made a massive impact in our ability to uh, recover from, from this disaster and, and begin to move forward. It's not just getting to the point of all the stuff is cut down that we can, it's then moving forward and what's next. And that's so, um, so much the result of your efforts with us to make that happen. Now we timed this perfectly because we have a good 15 minutes left for question and answer. Uh, and I'm going to uh, name my colleagues here with some of the questions. If you haven't put your questions in the Q&A box, now's the time to do it. I did see we had a question in the chat box as well. So we'll get that one also, um, but just in case, you know, you need to leave, uh, know that our contact information is right here on the slide. So if there's a question that you maybe are, you don't wanna ask uh, right now, live on this call, feel free to send us an email, give us a call. We also have a dedicated storm recovery page at brucemore.org. So go ahead and visit that brand new website uh, that we just launched this past summer and check out the information in the videos and the images at brucemore.org. But let's get to the question and answer section. So thank goodness for Jessica for answering that question that we had earlier uh, about, and I'm gonna mis mispronounce this, the Dachas in Russian, uh, in Russia. Uh, can you, you answered it in the question, but Jessica, can you just give us a really quick synopsis of what you um, were saying there? Yeah, uh, Libby asked a really great question about the country estate movement and its comparability to Dasha's in, in Russian. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. I took a Russian history class back in undergrad. So uh, that was that's the extent of my uh, Russian history knowledge. But um, I would say the primary, uh, kind of what I said in the, in the chat, if you didn't see the question, was the, the primary difference between like a Dhaka and 
um, the country state movement is one in its development. So those originate from uh, kind of packages of land that are given to elites by as gifts from the czar. Um, whereas like in the United States, there's not really a comparable um, uh, a system to that. So the, the origins and kind of development of it are, are different, but it, it might be more comparable to like the development of like feudal estates in, in Europe as their kind of packages of land that are given to uh, specific people as, as rewards for, for loyalty. Um, but since the, uh, the country estate movement was kind of um, kind of a harken back to that kind of feudal system in, um, or the origins of the feudal system. So kind of having these enclosed plots of land that are largely self-sufficient, it is comparable kind of in that sense. Uh, but the other main kind of difference is that these are, the dachas are usually used as kind of like a, a more of a vacation home. Uh, so kind of a, an, an escape, um, whereas country estates are, are more a functional uh, sort of living area. So designed for a family um, and servants and things like that to be on uh, more or less throughout the rest of the year. Um, so that, those are kind of the main uh, differences and comparable parts that I can see. Thank you for that interesting Russian history lesson that I had no idea. Uh, Erin, I'm going to send the next question over to you, uh, and this is from Mark, and I'm actually going to combine Mark and Mary's questions a little bit together. So uh, the questions are about um, why, where are we planting, how there seem to be a little, you know, some of the trees are close together, how does that impact their growth, um, and then where, are we, where did we ha find the current trees that we planted so far this year? Okay, good question. Um... So the trees that were planted along the pond, we lost about 50 trees from that area and we replaced, so those are tree seedlings that you get from the Iowa DNR that cost a dollar a piece. They come in bundles of 25. Um, they're planted so close together just because it's more of a woodland setting. So in a woodland setting, you don't typically see a, an individual tree kind of standing there to, to grow on its own. You know, you walk in the woods, you see trees growing within each other and the canopies kind of intertwine. So also their roots kind of interconnect, which, which is very beneficial to the, the health of trees. And even, especially if a storm were to blow through, but it's also to account for loss. Uh, we don't anticipate all of those trees surviving. Um, we planted, like I said, 50 tree seedlings there, but you know, if we have a hard drought or a deer comes in and nibbles those buds off, then that tree is a goner. So, um, so that, that's kind of why we planted so close together. And we sourced those through the Iowa DNR uh, state tree nursery. And Erin, I'm going to stay with you to follow up on that to say um, we, ha we had some smaller trees on the property when the storm hit, along with the, the more robust um, trees, the, the older trees that we had on the property. Uh, were, did we, in the cleanup efforts, make effort to keep as many of the small trees that were still standing as, as we could in the cleanup effort? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's an area behind the garden where we lost some big spruce trees, but it had a bunch of redbud volunteers growing, growing in there. So we definitely made an effort to uh, keep those there, but we didn't necessarily take them and transplant them to another place in the landscape just because it just goes along with... Um, <laughs> We want to make sure that we're putting the right tree in the right place before we get ahead of ourselves. We want to come out with a plan. So we did try to preserve what was left, though. Every tree that we could, right, Erin? Absolutely. And David, I'm going to send this next question over to you. Um, the types of trees in the location that we're planning to put in and that we have already put in, they're part what we've already planted has been part of some of those big picture goals that you're talking about, right? No, we're not just planning because we've gotten them or because we've had volunteers here, right? We're, we're, we're very specific about the kind of trees that we want to bring on site for sure. Uh, there are, as I said, there are kind of character defining features that are really fundamental uh, design elements that Mrs. Douglas and uh, O.C. Simons intended and Jessica mentioned the view sheds and and mentioned the lines of sight. And so those character defining features, uh, as Aaron said, we're kind of holding off on some of that. 
a lot of the replanting and the repopulating of trees was filtered um, through that lens. First of all, we, we wanted to avoid an area that we really wanted to spend a lot of time kind of designing and planning. Um, we also wanted to uh, make sure that it was a, a species that was appropriate to the original design and to the original experience of the estate. So when we were able to get um, trees uh, where Aaron sourced them or when we had, we had people volunteer uh, to provide trees for us, we found uh, appropriate spaces for them within the design but typically in a high density area, not exclusively, but typically in a higher density area where we needed to, to uh, flush out the landscape. So we, it was, a, it, was a, it was a dance between emotionally, all of us wanting to see a recovery start versus wanting to do it very thoughtfully and carefully. And that's, uh, as a staff, I think we all worked through that um, together. Every single tree that went in the ground, we tried to talk about what those opportunities were and, and trying to make sure that we're thoughtful about it. David, I'm going to stay with you. Mark has asked a wonderful question of what kind of annual investment will it take to complete this plan and all of the future phases that we're talking about? That, that's yet to be determined. It's an excellent question. I, I think it's fair to say we're in a six figure restoration for sure. Um, I think uh, over the, over the next four to five years. It's, it's, uh, um, it's contracted work. Um, I think there's an opportunity to do some really good things. The pond needed restoration anyway. Uh, the shoreline was eroding. The, we're not sure how good the base is. Uh, the plantings around that had overgrown. Um, there's still some, you know, we, we tried to um, uh, take as many dead and uh, mortally wounded trees as we could while we had FEMA money. There's a window where, where FEMA would cover until I think late spring, early summer of this year. And so we were very aggressive in taking things we knew were going to die anyway, because we that was the window to get them out on, on that dime. But we also wanted to, if, if a tree had a fighting chance, and there were tree by tree arguments in some cases where we all justified what we wanted or didn't. And um, I can point to some really significant trees that are going to make it because, you know, Aaron, David, and some others kind of argued that it could survive. But sadly, as Aaron said, there are some trees that, that, uh, uh, that aren't going to make it. So that will, that will continue um, that's going to be part of the cost. Stump removal is going to be part of the cost. Um, so there will be um, a substantial outlay, I think. And David, before you finish, um, we had this question earlier. Remind, remind our attendees today, insurance is, does not cover most of our landscape restoration. or No. Anything. Yeah, I think everyone, everyone experienced that, right, in the storm. Uh, insurance will cover a building or if something fell on a building, typically. Uh, our insurance um, is good. Uh, we're still having a couple of uh, disagreements over the scope of the mansion roof, but for the most part, our insurance has been very, very good, but they do not cover um, tree damage. If the tree fell on the Linden Gate, which it did, Linden Gate's covered. If it fell on uh, Statuary, um, it's co that's covered, but not if, it, if a tree fell on the woods, it's not covered. And we have a lot of woods and had a lot of trees. Indeed. And Erin, I'm going to send these uh, next questions over to you. We've got two, but we'll, we'll start with this one. Mary asks, who decides which trees to keep and how does that decision-making process work? Uh, myself, David Danson and David Morton uh, assessed most of, the, most of the trees and made those decisions. Um, so it was basically you kind of analyze a tree and its health, whether it has a, a, a broken branch off it. And there's, a, there's an assessment you do if, if uh, more than a third of that trunk is damaged, then it's a potential removal. Um, but also, as was previously mentioned, if a tree was damaged and we knew it wasn't going to survive past five years, um, we definitely were aggressive in, in removing it. So it was definitely a collaborative staff effort and something we didn't really take lightly and something that we analyzed several times uh, and walked the ground several times to, before making those decisions. 
And staying on that theme, Erin, talk to me about the formal garden, right? The formal garden lost so many of its, as, as Jessica talked about, the room walls, uh, the trees that were on the outside of that uh, character defining feature. How has the, the growing season in the past year with the flowers been impacted by the loss of those trees? Uh, yeah, there were five ash trees in the back of the garden back there, um, and then some locusts and some other trees along the back there, but it allowed a lot more sunlight to our garden, which in ways benefited it. Um, but we also have some beds back there that are specifically shade beds because they were growing in shade. So um, there's a good chunk, five or six beds that are going to be need to be completely uh, redesigned and, and replanted. But you just kind of had to wear your sunscreen and sunglasses but I would say the garden did pretty good. I would agree, particularly in this year. I'm gonna send this to each of you individually. I'm gonna start with Jessica um, because this next question is kind of interesting and I think I value all of your opinions. And um, this comes from an anonymous attendee tonight. Uh, and they start with a compliment that we have accomplished so much. And I appreciate you um, acknowledging that. That makes us feel a lot better. Uh, but what are you looking forward to in terms of the landscape in 2022? I am looking forward, I, um, I think, mostly to, to the pond restoration. I know that was kind of going to be our starting point for a lot of the projects. And I, I love the pond. It's one of my favorite features. And I, I think there's been a lot of interesting um, plantings and a lot of interesting um, iterations of the pond. So different um, linings, different uh, features that were added to it over time. So it's going to be really interesting as we kind of go through that process and kind of figure out what we want for it going forward to delve into some of the, the research that goes into it and uh, looking through the archives and just trying to kind of figure out what we want it to look like in the future. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to next year. How about you, Erin? Uh, most looking forward to, um, basically, I would say replanting. Uh, we've got some highly qualified folks in Heidi and a landscape architect, um, Brett Seelman. I'm excited to see what he is drawing up for us and so that we can just start to implement his plan. So, and, and getting, some, getting some people back on the property and excited to see uh, new, new roots on the ground. So. How about you, David Jansen? Yeah, I think we're, we're all itching to go it's been it's been I'm, I'm proud of the methodical thoughtful nature of it but it's also I think all of us have been frustrated um, that we can't fix it and make it look the way we want it to look immediately so it's going to be nice to see that progress accelerate I think um, I, I think for me it's something that people said you know before the storm we were we had initiated a multi-year process of restoring the mansion so we had scaffolding around the mansion it was fundamental work the the windows the wood the 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 doors the all of that was really rot and not in good shape and we launched a campaign and launched an effort to to uh, to take care of that that's our responsibility and uh, I know a couple of people uh, very kindly said boy I bet you would be happy when the scaffolding's gone and for me, the scaffolding is not the issue. The, I know what, what, what they're saying, but the, the scaffolding is not the damage. The scaffolding is the bandage. The scaffolding is the recovery. So I'm, I'm, while I'm excited about 2025, 2030, 2035, the way this estate is going to look as we pass it on to our successors, uh, I'm actually a little excited about seeing some of the grunt work that's going to be going on next year by contractors, you know, supported and led and directed by our staff, but to see some major construction work going on in certain areas and replanting at a massive scale, I think that's going to be invigorating. Uh, we all are starting to get a sense of what it's going to look like, and that's exciting, but to be able to watch that disruptive and uh, but productive and and positive work go on is going to be exciting. So David I'm going to stay with you because we have a question and it's kind of a two-parter uh, but it goes together. How can the community help? What can what needs to be donated? What needs volunteer activities to support the next year and the next five years in recovery? Thank you for that question. Um, 
a number of ways. I think, first of all, if stay engaged with us. We, we, we try very hard to keep everyone updated. This is part of that, but our social media posts, our website, mailings, uh, stay engaged with Bruce Moore. We are obviously more than just a landscape, but right now that's one of the four or five things that's front and center for us. So um, if you care about that, stay engaged with us and, and continue to, to interact with us um, and enjoy the estate, continue to enjoy the estate. Uh, if you are so inclined, certainly donations are appropriate. And um, you can find that on our website um, and you can designate uh, donations specifically for the landscape uh, as it goes into our Pride and Preservation Fund, our, our preservation uh, fund that was started by our campaign, uh, which we concluded last year. Um, so you can designate that, that money uh, for that. And then, um, you know, we, we um, try to be very intentional about when, when we need volunteers for the major work. Aaron has a, has a, a crew of people who help him. Um, there are these massive all hands on deck moments that we do need people. And then there are sort of daily rhythms that we we help, uh, we need help. Um, so stay in touch with that. Uh, I would say that at this point, we probably aren't looking for specific tree donations now because we, we wanna make sure that we funnel that into the planning plan. They'll be very specific. Um, we have uh, been very careful about what trees we brought on. Everything we brought on has been appropriate to, to uh, an O.C. Simon's philosophy and to uh, a native uh, kind of plant philosophy. But um, going forward, we want to, at this point, we want to pause on tree donations and wait for the, the planting plan to get very specific about type, size, species, things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap it up uh, for this evening. We want to thank you all so much for your questions and wonderful comments and also just for joining us tonight and um, getting updated on what's going on. And uh, we hope you're all looking forward to kind of seeing what comes next um, as much as, as we are. So um, again, brucemore.org, if you have um, any more questions about recovery and just kind of keep up on our socials as well. 